Hello and good morning. It's Jeffrey Cohen, week 41. It's October 12, 2021. We're back online. What happened? Where'd you go, Jeff? We watch your videos every week. We get a sense of the market. I mean, I, you called the top on the S&P 500. Where'd you go? So let me tell you where we went. We had problems with our market data provider. Uh, the data was unreliable. The data was missing information. And so we had to rip and replace. So we completed it. We have a new market data provider. We've recoded part of the model, the first third. Uh, there's a lot more to do, right? Because there's a lot more capability and features in Intrinio, which is our new professional, professional grade market data provider. And um, it's just the beginning for us. And so what we're going to talk about today is two things. We're going to talk about well, what we learned from re-architecting. You can see the picture, right? Why is the picture like that? Well, it's simple. What happens is, over time, we've been running this model for two years, we've created such complex structures that uh, just unwinding the code was so hard. And so now, we're trying to take a clean sheet. And so, for those who know Python, you got arrays, you got data frames, and you've got lists. And what we've realized is, let's go back to the basics. Let's use lists. Lists use less memory, they're faster, they're cleaner. And so, but that means a whole bunch of new tool sets in order to be able to use them. And so we're doing that now. We're working very hard to reduce the memory and the storage footprint of our runs um, in the hopes of making them run faster. Right now, our model takes over seven hours to run seven hours what are you nuts how are you gonna make any money running it for seven hours well here's the problem maybe it's a good problem we're loading in so much data on so many tickers that we're analyzing four thousand last night we analyzed four thousand one hundred and sixty two tickers that's a search space of 10 to the 1250th power just to put it into perspective, I think that might be more molecules on the earth or more people that have ever lived in all time. It could be more um, breaths that everybody takes in a year, in a hundred worlds. It's a lot of stocks and each stock is analyzed with every other stock. 4,162 stocks all held together and you got to see what the best combination is. Well, the good news is we ran the model last night. And for the first time in a while, wow, pop, we got tremendous results. We got, from a technical perspective, very high quality results. Hopefully, from a market perspective, the, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Let's see how the stocks do that, that the model picked to go up. So... At some point, we'll report them. You know, paying clients get that right away. My uh, loyal listeners, you might have to wait a few weeks, and then I'll, I'll let you know how it went. But um, it's a big deal. So let me tell you the first thing that happened. So we went with the big name brand on the market data providers. The first thing I did is I, I reached out. I saw the, the stock exchanges, ICE, NASDAQ, you know, international um Continental Exchange. And so here's the problem. For those, they're really made for large firms. They're really not. They, they really want you to work with like a system integrator or a data reseller, right? And so then, so fine, fine. Then we go to a really big company. If I said the name, you'd be like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, big one. And I remember the conversation, Jeff. You know, it's going to be a minimum of $5,000 a month. And in fact, I, I don't even want that business. That's crap business. I don't want it. 5000 a month. You're going to be like my smallest client. I don't know. Just, you know, whatever. But, so then I, I wrote them because I was having trouble logging in because you needed all this stuff. And like, oh, I, whatever. But they closed the ticket. I never got to log in. So here's the challenge, right? So... Big, big data provider, expensive, 5000 a month, right? Terrible client service um, because they're expecting you to have your own IT department. Well, you're looking at the IT department, right? 
Okay. So then I got very, I got frustrated. I got to tell you, I got a little depressed when it came to the market data issue. So I went back to my old McKinsey days. Let me see if I got this. Uh, I don't have it. Back to my old McKinsey days. Ooh, look at the charts on the wall. All right, let's pull a few things up here. We're going to use them for later. So, McKinsey always said, make, they taught me, make things simple. See that? Edward Tuft, he makes things simple. Some of my favorite visualizations of all time were written by this man. So, here. I'm just going to look for one of my favorites. Yeah, here we go. So, in London, there was a big issue, okay? Um, there was a lot of uh, sickness in an area. So you see where the yellow is? You see where the dots are? The dots were where the people got sick. Okay? And the yellow is where the water came from. So guess what? It took a real rocket scientist to plot where the people got sick and where the water came from. First, he didn't know where the water came from. He didn't even care. He just looked for where the dots were. Oh, boom. People getting sick in like three areas. Now, guess what? One of the concentration places was like a bar restaurant where people got their water. And so what they found out was two of the wells were poisoned or infected, got everyone sick. Once they shut the wells down, there were no more cases. Oh, miracle. So if you visualize the data, you get a better sense of it. And so this is true, I mean, across the board, right? I, I visualize dividend data and uh, stock splits and, and volatility, but just visualize this. Make a little chart and say, here's the data providers, here's the cost, here's the functionality. Can I use it? Yes or no? Is it really hard to use? And does it have all the data I want? So it ended up being simple. Column one, who are all the market data providers? Column two, what's it cost? Column three, does it have yes or no, the functionality I need? And column four, how difficult is it going to be? And what I found was the chart ended up being very simple at the end. So we found a data provider in Trinio that was cost effective, has all the data we need, and now we're working through it, right? Now you get into the, the nitty gritty details after you code it. But you know what? We're back up. We're back up and running. And um, data is an amazing thing. Data really helps you to move forward. And so, and now we're clean sheeting the architecture. And I got to tell you, it's, be it's beautiful. I love the code now. So, big lesson learned. Lesson learned number two is don't lose that opportunity to re-architect. So, let's say you're going on a camping trip. You can bring all the same stuff you always bring, or you could sit down, write on a piece of paper, well, what do I need for the camping trip? And then go through it and try to minimize. So now, maybe you fit everything in a backpack. Now you feel great. You know, you get off the bus on a backpack, you go hiking into the woods, and you feel good. You don't have to have six cases of stuff, right? And so what we did is we clean sheeted, and by the way, we made a huge mistake. It was awesome. We clean sheeted the model, and we changed the Chicago Quantum Net score, and we destroyed everything. Oh, my God. It was awful. It was awful. It was awful. So you know what? We changed two words, we did it the old-fashioned way, and it worked great. But the idea was we took a shot. We took a shot, so now we use less memory. It's taking longer to run because now we have almost 4,200 stocks that we analyze. I want you to think about that. When we wrote our paper two years ago, we did 40 stocks. <laughs> and, and it was hard. And we were like, oh, 40 stocks. Then we did 60 stocks. And we're like, oh, this is too hard. I remember I had a, a, a laptop running for three days to analyze 60 stocks. Well, then we got to like, I don't know, 1,600. And the world was going to end. 
And then I remember when we talked to our client, and we're like, would you like us to, to increase it to 3300 He's like, yeah, Jeff, please do it. Um, and at 3300 stocks, I had to buy a new server, new, new Mac server, new Dell server. Um, I bought a fan because when they run, they get so hot, you could burn your fingers on the equipment. It's so hot. Um, and now... 4,200 stocks. And by the way, we're pulling in 5,400 stocks and we're data validating them out. If if these stocks happen to trade according to our data validation rules, things like minimum maximum stock price, minimum maximum beta range, um, minimum maximum, no, not minimum, maximum, minimum volume, have to trade every day. They have to have traded for a full year every day. I mean, we could be up to over 5,000 stocks. So, Blow your head off. So now it's great. So I want to thank you. I want to thank anyone who was patient. We've had two clients be very patient with us, which I appreciate. Um, we're going to reopen on our website. We had taken all those services off. And so now that's terrific news. Maybe the other thing is to communicate well when things aren't working. And then, of course, communicate when things are working. But when you really build trust is when things aren't working and you're just open and honest about it. So... Good. So that was our creating change, clean sheet, nice and elegant. Let's see if that works. So now I want to talk about some other stuff. So I don't know if you guys remember, but we had discussed with you that the S&P 500 was plateauing. And we sure didn't like it because we thought that the momentum behind the S&P 500 was going to be driven driven by what's happening in the past and kind of like habits forming. So what happens is when markets go up, they tend to keep going up. Why is that? Well, that's a good question. Well, the reason that they keep going up in many cases is that you make a bet. If you're, if you're a big fund, you're, you're just to say a J.P. Morgan Chase. A city bank. And you make a bet. You're like, all right, I got an exchange. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you uh, like an S and P five hundred, but with a little kick to it. That's something different, right? Not just like a Vanguard S and P five hundred, but I'm gonna give you an actively managed but low cost model, right? But but I can't I can't leave you exposed to all the risks. So I'm gonna hedge some stuff away, right? And so now I've got a big exposure. I've got a lot of hedge. And the market moves. So if I want to keep the hedge and I want to keep my limited risk exposure, I've got to double down. So sometimes I'm lucky and I get to sell some of my hedge and I get to make cash. I'm loving it, right? So I'm managing a fund and I'm taking cash out and I'm loving life. But in other times, I have to add cash back in. I have to double down again. I have to do a martingale. For those who remember, martingales are very dangerous. It's like going to the casino, playing blackjack, you lose. So you double your bet. You lose again. So you double your bet. You start with $2. You're at 4 You're at 8 You're at 16 32 64 You win. All right. You're up a dollar. Start back at 2 well, the problem with doubling down and buying the dip is it only works if the market eventually goes back up again. So let's take a look at the S&P. And this is going back from about October of last year. This is a year, okay? So it was, this is zero, zero percent. I'm going to draw a little chart for you. Draw a little line. I don't know. Let's see what we can talk about here. From here to here, it looks great. It looks straight up. But you can see it's not straight up. So for the first six months or so, it dropped. And then if you bought the dip, you made out like a bandit. Okay. And what I'm doing, the blue is the S&P 500 ETF. And the, the, the candles are the, um, the actual index. So if the blue line and the index are not quite matching, um, that's your inefficiency of the ETF. That's all. Uh, exchange trade fund, which um, the objective is to mirror the S&P 500. So let's take a look. So if you bought the dip 
here. Oh, you made money like crazy in November. You bought it here. You see, so what's happening now is that there's more dips. The dips are getting a little deeper too, and they're more consistent. So this was a dip January 29. This is a dip March 4. This is a dip March 24. This is a dip um, May 12. June 18, July 19, August 19. So it's monthly, September 20. So every month you're seeing a dip. I'm going to make a guess that those dips are around options, expiration dates for individual stocks and for the indices. Um, and I'm not just making a guess. I know it's usually the third Friday of the month. That's about when those things are happening. And so you've got options related declines in the market. And that's because you have to unwind those positions and you have to reapply. Unwind, roll them forward. So I think what's been happening is the market got a little ahead of itself and it's been correcting back, correcting back, correcting back, correcting back. And then we call the top at 44.32, which is right about where my cursor is, right about there. And so it did go up a little more, but then it went down. And it's down now. It's down. I don't like it. I don't like it because, to be honest, I talk a good game about selling short and about betting on the downside. But do you know I've never sold one stock, one share of stock short in my entire life? That's not true. That's not true. Netscape and Press Tech. Back in 1991... I sold stock short in 1991, and you know I made so much money, I bought a car. So, But I felt dirty selling short, so I don't sell short now. But maybe I will over time, but for right now, my model actually does a great job for those who like to sell short. I could give you the stocks that are the dog meat stocks that are just going to go down, but whatever. So we call the top here, and now if you bought the dip, you kind of didn't do that well. In fact, the dips are getting lower. And so the Dow theory says that if your highs are lower, let's take a look at this for a minute. Because I, I don't, I got to tell you, I don't like this picture. If your tops get lower, okay, and your bottoms get lower, That's, that's doom in the markets. Tops get lower. Bottoms get lower. If this happens long enough on a daily chart, because as the market drops, you have to protect yourself. And so in many cases, it sounds counterintuitive, but when the market drops, you have to sell. See, for us, when the market drops, we want to buy. So... I got money on the sidelines, right? I sold up here. I want to buy when it goes down. I mean, if I can get $10 worth of stock for $2, I want to do that all day long. But we don't know how far the market's going to fall. And so we call the top. It's dropping. And I want to talk about some of the factors. And I got a little notebook here because I'm one of those old-fashioned guys that uses a notebook, right? So the first thing is 10-year yields. So 10-year U.S. Treasury, um, I guess they're notes still, right? They're at 1.6%. Now, this is not a high yield. No, it is not. 1.6, relatively speaking, these things 3%, 6%, I mean, crazy numbers, right? We're not there. And if inflation's running at 3% and your 10-year yield is at 1.6%, you're, you're losing money when you buy treasuries on a real basis. So that says to me, either there's some issue with treasury bonds and notes because of like this whole Fed and other central banks buying debt, right? Or just, it's just things are going to start to unwind with the taper. And so right now, 1.6 doesn't bother me. Right? 10 year yield of 1.6 does not bother me at all. It's nothing. It's nothing. Right? The problem is, is where's is it going to be next week or a month from now? Is it going to be 3%? Or 
Are we going to see 3% long-term interest rates because people are scared of inflation? Or are we staying at 1.5, 1.6? If it's 1.5, 1.6, you're good. Right? Number two, strong U.S. dollar. Very strong dollar. So I was thinking that things were going to be bad for the dollar, right? I really thought so, right? Our trade deficit is through the roof. They're talking about not paying the interest on the debt, having a debt ceiling crisis. But I think all that is just like noise. It's just media frenzy. We're going to pay our debt as the United States. We want to be the reserve currency. And so what happens is as a reserve currency, when this kind of stuff happens and the market is tumultuous, when China starts cracking down on banks and on Bitcoin, when Europe doesn't know what to do because inflation is nipping at their heels, they run to the U.S. dollar. It's a safe haven. And so I think what you're seeing is that safe haven. Now, the good news about a strong dollar means that um, it, 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 it's good. It's good. There's issues too, but that's good. The next is we do have this accelerating trade deficit. And normally, I'd be preaching to you about buy American, right? Trade deficit. I don't like it, right? Buy American. But the problem is, is that not a lot of things are made in America anymore. And it's it's kind of, I sound like an old man when I say buy American. The truth is, you buy what's on sale. You buy the best value. You don't worry about where it was made anymore. Right when I buy coffee in my for my Keurig, I mean I like when it says 100% Colombian, but truthfully, where's the plastic cup made? I don't know. I don't know if I buy a phone. I just want the best phone. I don't know where it's made. I went out and I bought groceries. I bought celery. It was probably made in Mexico. The bananas are made in Guatemala. Do I care? No, I just want good ripe bananas that taste good for my family and that are healthy. Right. So we have an accelerating trade deficit, but it's going to run into a solid brick wall. Boom. What's happening? What's happening is supply chain issues. Um, there's not enough room on the container ships. We have pipeline issues. For some reason, we went against the pipelines. You need pipelines to get the energy from country to country or else you're going to have to throw them on a ship and, and send them that way. Or you have to put them on a railroad car or you have to put them in a truck. Can you imagine pouring crude oil in a truck or a train car and shipping it to a refinery and it sits in a train car and something happens, it derails? No, thank you. You know what? Put it in a pipeline. It's the safest thing. Hang on one second. Just to show you what I do every day, I sit here and I have stock prices moving. And I look at who's trading, who's making a market, who's buying, who's selling. One of these days I'll show you. So what happens is you follow your stock and you look at the colors changing, right? So this is Corbis at a buck five, buck and five cents. And you see there aren't that many shares. There's only 1,200 shares at a buck being offered to sell. If somebody came in with 100 grand and wanted to take a position with Corbis, they could jack this thing to about a buck 10 in no time, right? But no one's doing that. No one wants it. No one's trading it. It's old news. It's old product. It's cold, right? Corbis is cold. Nobody wants it. So at a buck four, nobody cares. No one's moving it. Look at this. Against the S&P 500, it's underperforming the S&P 500. The, uh, the moving average is down. The RS, no, the volume is down. The volume is way down, minus 90. Let's take a look at the RSI. Not that I'm... Uh, um, what the hell's the word? Not that I'm ADD or ADHD, but uh, take a look at this crap. It's a 43 RSI, which isn't that terrible. This stock can't get out of its own way. The last time this stock had an uptick was in May. Right? It went up from May to June 1st. 
The thing's been in a decline the whole time. Who the hell wants to buy it? Who wants to put 10 grand into this stock? Nobody does. Except me, of course. I'm in the stock. I'm a bag holder. I'm holding a big fat bag of Corbis. And there's nothing I'm going to do. I'm going to hold it. And I'm even going to buy more. And I'm just waiting. Because when they discover the stock again. Oh. Hang on. I got to show you. Yeah. When they discover the stock again. You know what's going to happen? This thing can go to $3. You could triple my money in a week, right? I, I want to be long Corbis because actually the research they're doing, it's, you know, the fundamentals are so excellent on Corbis. But truthfully, the minute that the memers decide they want to get back into this stock, it's three bucks again. I love that. All right, so let's go back to where we are. We have an accelerating trade deficit and we have a supply chain issue which is out the door and so at some point if we insist on buying foreign goods we're just gonna start paying more for them and the shelves are gonna be empty wow okay energy inflation so if I asked you what's the price of oil you probably don't know you probably know the price of gasoline though you go to the pump in Lake County Illinois it's about $3.50 a gallon. Do you know, it, it's not always been that expensive. It's like $2 normally. And so what happens is, I remember seeing charts about this. That it's bad because the people have a certain amount of money in their wallet to spend each week. I mean, whatever your job is, you kind of if you had $100 or $1,000, you have a certain amount of money to spend each week. Whether it's on groceries or on clothes or a night out with your best person or a movie, or anything. You want to buy a book. You want to buy some clothes. You want to do anything, right? You got a certain amount of money. So when a price of gasoline goes up the, to, to fill your tank, because most people fill their tank once or twice a week, that money comes right out of the others. There's no extra money, right? And so if you had $100, let's say you work minimum wage, you get 80 bucks to spend in a week. Well, if the price of gas goes up by $30 a tank, that's thirty dollars less at the grocery store, and that's a hell of thirty dollars less than at the at the shoe store. You're not going to buy shoes if you can't drive your car unless you want to run to work, right? Oil is over eighty dollars a barrel. The United States was the largest oil producer under President Trump. Under President Biden, I believe that is no longer the case. The first thing President Biden did on the first day in office, I believe, if I remember right, is he canceled the XL pipeline. So he he spit in the face of Canada's energy producers. So you know what happened? I watched. I, I get the uh, Baker Hughes drilling numbers. The Canadians stopped drilling new wells. Oh, no. Oil's too high. We need more drilling. More drilling. Well, we just stopped our brothers and sisters in Canada from drilling. We did that. We did that self-imposed. Okay. So what else? We're doing moratoriums and legislative acts to stop drilling in the United States. My own daughter says to me, Jeff, if you love the environment, you'll stop fracking. I'm like, I love fracking. Do you know why? Because I get the oil out of the ground. I get it out cheaply. I drill fewer wells, or if I'm going to have wells, I get more production. So now, and I'm getting natural gas, natural gas, which is the cleanest source of energy other than maybe nuclear and switchgrass and solar that we have, right? Do you want a nuclear power plant in your backyard? I mean, maybe. Maybe I do. But, you know, I remember, you know, when uh, the nuclear power plants were dangerous, Right? I don't know. We, have we even built a new one in 35, 40 years? I think Toshiba went out of business with their nuclear business. Um, so you got to drill. You got to drill. And when you have fracking, you have cleaner energy. So all this talk about no more drilling. And in fact, so what do you have? You have $80 a barrel oil and you have people not able to buy shoes. So... When we talk about inflation, normally, you know, we want to exclude energy, right? Because it's different. But the problem is, is that for most people, like I drove my car this morning. I had to take my daughter to school. 
the bus didn't show up. So you know what? I burned gas, right? Got more expensive to take her to school. So we have a high energy inflation. We have uncertainty over fiscal policy and monetary policy. Well, let me ask you something. When they talked about spending three and a half trillion dollars on Build Back Better, okay? Did you believe that they were really going to spend it? Did you think for a minute, oh, it's free money for me? It's good. I'll take it. But what are they going to give you? $1,000? The problem is three and a half trillion dollars is a really a lot of money. And so now they're saying maybe it's going to be one and a half trillion. We don't know in terms of like fiscal policy. How about this? You know, the reason why there was a bad employment picture last week was because they're firing government workers. They're reducing the growth rate in government workforce. So the truth is, they're talking out of one side of the mouth. Oh, three and a half trillion. Hey, Jeff, we're going to give you money, free money, three and a half trillion. And the other side of the mouth, get out of here, you're fired. You're not working anymore. The government doesn't need you. Okay, so what's the real answer? A weasel, a dirty, stinking weasel talks out of both sides of their mouth. What are we doing? On the other side, and by the way, I'm thankful to a hedge fund for talking about that in their uh, guiding principles. From a monetary policy, right? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna pump up the economy, which is still not ready yet. But then, oh, we're gonna taper. We're gonna we're gonna stop pumping up the the economy with our monetary policy. Oh, there's great employment data. Oh, there's terrible employment data. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Does anyone know what the Federal Reserve is gonna do? I mean, I knew what they were going to do six months ago. They were going to wait for signs of progress in the economy. They were going to wait for COVID to kind of damp down. And then they were going to raise interest rates and they were going to stop pumping money. Well, we're here and I don't hear a clear message. And so I think that uncertainty causes problems. Oh, by the way, the Biden administration talked about raising taxes on corporations again, like a lot. Like one of the reasons the stock market went up, you saw the chart, was because they lowered the tax rates on corporations. Well, he wants to, he wants to raise them again. Now, I'm not saying whether that's a bad idea or not. You got to make money somehow. You have a choice on how you do it. You either spend less or you raise taxes. But what do you think? All of the gains in the stock market because of the lower tax rate will be gone. And the minute that that legislation looks like it's going to pass. Everyone has an obligation, a fiscal and a, and a moral responsibility. Like I would have a fiduciary responsibility to my investors to sell, to bet that it's going to go down. I have to. They raised the taxes by 40% on companies, 20 to 28%. You got to sell. You got to dump it. You got to run. Run to the hills. But here's the thing. They're not clear. Just tell me, oh, hey, Jeff, we're going to be raising the corporate tax rate by 40%. It's going to happen on January 1st. Thank you. So now I know when to buy my puts, right? But there's this uncertainty. So come on. Quit playing with clients' money. Quit playing with my money. It's not your money. You get a little bit of money, you get the taxes, you get like 35, 40%, federal, state, and local. I think you get 40% of the nation's income. Stop there. Don't take any more. Okay? Bitcoin is up to $57,000 a coin. And China says it's illegal to trade in it. And the U.S. is talking about regulating it. $57,000 Bitcoin. What's going on? World markets were down yesterday. Right? So it's not just the U.S. We're actually seeing a global conundrum in the markets. Okay? I want to talk a little bit about COVID. So COVID, COVID's in the United States running about 100,000 new cases a day and 1,000 deaths, a little more actually, a day. So 100,000 cases, 1,000 deaths, 1%. Do you hear anything about it anymore? No. So the good news is last year it dipped in September, but then it started raising through October into November, December. So let's hope 
that will change the trajectory. But for right now, COVID could be on a downturn. It could be all the vaccines, and now we're tripling up, we're, we're boosting. Um, maybe it's just the new normal that a thousand people a day die, but I don't think so. So I don't know what's going to happen with COVID. Um, that's a big question mark on the market because it feels like we're in a new normal. I don't read about it anymore. Do you? Do you hear about it in news? Oh, a thousand people died yesterday. Oh, a thousand people going to die today. Do you know any of them? Maybe. Maybe it's your family member, right? Who's who's getting sick? People get sick at my wife's work and I get worried for them. I know these people, right? And so they get sick, maybe they get a fever. Now normally you think, oh, it's the flu, no problem. Take a Z pack, wrap it up. But now you worry, right? The other thing I want to talk about is the labor, labor situations changing. Now this is big, okay? I'm gonna talk about it. So Kellogg's, they make cereal, right? Battle Creek, Michigan, about as American as like apple pie, right? Snap, crackle, pop, Tony the Tiger, right? These are American brands. And you know, the, the local in Battle Creek, Michigan went on strike. And the reason they did that is because the jobs, the higher paying jobs are moving to Mexico. Now, all right, fine. They're saving 20% of those jobs. But the problem is that these people worked through COVID. They worked 16 hours a day, six days a week, because people were out, they were afraid. And so those who stayed really pushed. And now most companies are doing more with less. They have fewer employees because they've realized we can shut the offices. We can send everyone home. What, what do I got to do? I got money coming in. I got money going out. What do I really need? I need my manufacturing facilities, my production facilities, a couple of a couple of back office staff and some salespeople. And they're doing away with a lot of people. So when Kellogg decides that they're going to offshore those best office jobs to Mexico, you know... I stand with the strike. Boycott Kellogg. Boycott Kellogg. Stop sending jobs overseas. These are people that are third, fourth, you know, the local, the president of the local is a fourth generation Kellogg employee. And they're just worried, you know, death by a thousand cuts. When is it their turn for them to be out of a job? And then they can't even afford the cereal that they're making or that they used to make. And so now I'm hearing John Deere. John Deere's got a strike or has got an issue with their labor. And so part of the challenge is, is that corporate earnings are up. We're really doing more with less on labor. And it's time to pay. There's inflation. It's time to pay up. So now I'm going to show you my favorite picture. This has been on my wall for about 30 years. New leg of inflation race. Wages and prices. And then big governments boosting pay for themselves as well. It's Schumacher. God, I love this, right? I've been waiting to be able to show this for about 30 years. Waiting for inflation to go up. Wages. Wages, right? Racing forward with prices raging fo racing forward. And the government is pumping more money into the system. And nobody knows what to do, right? Well been a long time since we've seen that and we're kind of there now right i'm not even saying the data shows it right but just the feeling that i have is we got to start paying workers more and now let me tell you the other side of it so why did i have to drive my daughter oh by the way my neighbor's son to school it's because we love our bus driver our standard regular everyday bus driver but every time she has an issue she's got to go home she doesn't feel well, got a little fever, one of her family members is sick, whatever. She takes a day off. Because we used to work when we were sick. I remember going to work, blood dripping down my face. And it didn't matter, right? I was still there. Blood, guts, everything. And I still went to work. I had clients to serve. Can you imagine? I had people to supervise. Now, oh my God, I have a little sniffle. I can't go to the gym, can't go to work. I'm sorry. One of my family members is sick. I can't go. I have to quarantine. So what's happened is her bus driver was out. New bus driver comes 30 minutes late. I got to race the kid to school that those two kids were late because we're waiting for the bus and the neighbor's calling the bus company. Oh, it's five more minutes, five more minutes. Well, you know what? 
by then they might as well stay home, right? At, so I asked at school what's going on. Well, they've got administrators now teaching the kids. And they got the backup floaters who weren't even teachers. I, I don't know that it was the janitor, but it's definitely people that are just kind of hanging around the school, all of a sudden teaching your kids science. Because the teachers are out. It's hard to get workers. It's hard to get people to want to work. But no, we're not, we're maybe even talking four or five hundred grand a year, but imagine somebody making 20 bucks an hour. And now you tell them you got to go to work and you got to touch 50 people a day. 500 people a day. You got to be a frontline worker. So what's happening is there's less labor. There's less labor consistency and there's less labor reliability. And now companies are getting a little pushback because you know what? When it costs an extra dollar a gallon to drive to work and I bought a big gas guzzler to support my economy, well, now I'm in trouble because now I can't afford food, right? So I'm asking for a couple bucks more an hour on wages. Well, so Federal Reserve, focus on what you're doing here. And the Biden administration, focus on your energy policy. You did this. You caused the price of energy to go up by shutting down pipelines and talking trash about energy. Well, stop it. Stop it. Help America remain energy independent. So when energy is 80 bucks a barrel and when coal price of coal goes through the roof, we're exporting it. We should be the ones making the money and we should be able to help our people keep the price down, right? So if we're the ones shipping oil at 80, maybe the price drops to 60 because OPEC suddenly is worried, right? That they're not going to make as much money. So here's where we're at. Big picture. I'm going to step back and I'm going to close the video. So I'm very proud to announce that Chicago Quantum is back. Our model's rebuilt with brand new data. And in fact, we're rebuilding our quantum runs on D-Wave this week, hopefully into next week. We're going to have to re-architect the whole thing to run better on D-Wave with the new data. So we're up and running. We're going to re-up our website so people can buy runs and they can sign up. Number two is we call the top at 4432 of the S&P 500. We're not happy we did that. The market's down about 100 points. But there's so much uncertainty in the market. There's so much bad news that I find it hard to imagine that the market's going to hit 5,000. Oh, it's going to be up 20% this year. I, how do I say that? I don't know. I kind of feel like we'll be lucky if we end the year at 4432, you know, in a couple months from now. I don't know. And third, we're still holding the same three biotech stocks. Maybe we're going to go for long-term capital gains and all three stocks were great. They were great about two, three months ago. They were in the model. They were top notch. Now all three of them are bottom 20% of the model. They have high volatility and they have low beta and low expected returns. It's garbage. So I'm holding them because of fundamentals. I bought them because of technicals. They went through the roof. If I would have sold, I would have been 40% in 20 business days. Now I'm down 16%. So, all right. Thank you for listening. I hope you had a great, uh, great time listening. I hope you have a great day in the markets. Make some money. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye now.